Have you ever wondered what lies beyond the ordinary geometry you learned in school? Are you ready to step into a mind-bending world where shapes can twist, turn and merge in ways you have never seen before? Are you intrigued by the idea of exploring spaces that seem to defy our intuition? Ever wondered what mathematicians mean by smooth, flat and locally Euclidean spaces? Manifolds are like portals to alternate dimensions where the rules of geometry become a mesmerizing dance of curves and surfaces. In this video, we are going to take a look into the concept of manifold. I am going to use more of visuals so that the core concept of manifold is clear to you and you get a complete picture and a complete good idea in your mind. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. Welcome to the 19th lesson of Introducing Different Geometry where we are learning a beginner's guide to manifold. Well, first we will see that why do we at all need a manifold? What would have been the world without manifold? Is it that manifold is an absolute necessity? Coming up into the next part of our video. So when we see these type of structures, any structures like for example a toy, for example a ball or any kind of complex engineering structures, if I see this kind of a structure, what we basically understand from this these structures is that all these structures needs a surface. Here is the surface of the ball, here is the surface of the building. These are all the different surfaces. So obviously when we are using geometry or when we are trying to measure curvatures, angles, triangles, everything will stand or lie on a surface, isn't it? So we can tell that all these objects need a surface and manifold is basically a kind of a study of these surfaces. That means we are going to study how much they are curved, they are bent, they are twisted, there is a hole or so on. So the need for manifold is that how can we measure any geometrical structure, building, bridges, etc. without knowing that what actually lies beneath that structure. That beneath the structure object is what we call a manifold and in order to study that then we will understand how the object and the structures behave. Now obviously the first question that will come to your mind is this that is surface and manifold the same because right now I have just told you that these actually needs a surface. Then the question before we go into the deep understanding of mathematics is that are surfaces and manifold the same? Let us look into this part of the video. Now before I start I, I would like to tell you there is no tabular structure where we can say that okay this is A, this is B and this is but are general features, distinguishing features through which you can come to know the kind of a difference between surfaces and manifold. So here is a two dimensional uh, surface and I have just taken a sphere because this is an ideal structure when we learn manifold. So you see a surface is basically a two-dimensional two mathematical object. The intrinsic geometry is actually determined, determined by the distances and angles that we measure, quite obvious. Surfaces can be equipped with a metric, that means how much the distance and the angles etc. they do. So the metric determines that. Now we come to manifold. See manifold is more general concept that extends beyond two dimensions. As we will see when we go into the mathematics of manifold, things which are more than two, three or even four dimensions, those n dimensions can be expressed through manifolds. Manifolds can have number of dimensions, not just two. The intrinsic geometry of a manifold is determined by the way it locally bends and stretches. That is why we call differential geometry is a study of geometry which is local. You might ask me what is global obviously topology. And what we see is that manifolds have many complicated topological properties. What are those? Say for example these are connectedness, orientability, compactness. So we will do, deal with this in the later part of the video that what it actually denotes. And we say that differential geometry actually plays a significant role in the study of manifolds where they are equipped with additional structures. What are those additional structures? These are, there is a metric, there is a connection, there is a curvature, there is a geodesics and so on. 
So you see from this particular part of the video, you can understand that surface is two dimensional and intrinsic geometry is determined by the distance and it is equipped with a metric. Various manifold is more than two or three dimensions. The intrinsic geometry is determined by how much it bends. It has many additional features like connectedness, etc. And it has additional structure like matrix, connection, curvature and geodesics. Now, the question lies that these manifolds are they used only in mathematics or topology or is it used in other uh, areas of uh, science also this is important because once we encounter the word manifold maybe when you are reading a biology book or some engineering books you might say that what is happening in differential geometry we read about manifold this is manifold is this the same so to avoid all those confusions in this part of the video we will just quickly look into are manifolds only found in mathematics so manifolds are used in engineering and fluid mechanics this is what is called a gas manifold an engine part that collects the exhaust gas from multiple cylinders into one pipe also known as headers this picture shows a component used to regulate fluid flow in a hydraulic system thus controlling the transfer of power between them this is called an exhaust manifold then we have got an inlet manifold an engine part that supplies the air of fuel or air and mixture to the cylinders and we have got a scuba set which connect uh, two or more diving cylinders that you when you go for a scuba dive and there is one which is called a vacuum gas manifold an apparatus used to chemistry to manipulate gases and finally we have got this hydraulic manifold so you see now uh, uh, the, i believe the concept is clear that manifolds are not used in only mathematics and differential geometry engineering fluid mechanics also uses manifold now we come to the central question what is a manifold and i won't define it mathematically at the first go but i will say you on a very basic easy understanding so manifold comprises of two words many plus fold now if i go back a little bit to the history you see the west saxon used something called manic field and middle english many and proto germanic mangas and fold coming from the northumbrian word fald old english fjeld dutch woud when i take the left hand side meaning of the word many and then the fold what i get is that many means obviously many numerous different elements of the features consisting of a kind of operating of many or one combined and have different features or forms so it is quite clear that many means something which is different element of features and which has got different forms here comes the fold obviously it means to bend or uh, wrap or fold or bend or ply anything so that means from this uh, many and fold we get the ideal definition is that manifold are objects or topological space which deals with numerous shapes and that are bent furled or wrapped and that lie one after the another this is a very basic understanding of the literal word of the use many and fold now let us be a little bit more mathematically precise and see what actually it means here comes every point on a manifold has a small area which looks like euclidean and a manifold is a topological space that locally resembles euclidean space near each point that means it is a kind of a structure which will have some area which locally looks euclidean that means we can use the school level geometry or the euclidean geometry uh, uh, the, that will that that will that will be there now let us look into what is a manifold visually i take a sphere and what i do is that i start walking from here to here and from here to here and from here to here and so on and then finally i end up here so this is my path this is my journey across a sphere now uh, now what i do is that i plot the same journey on the sphere on a kind of a curved but locally equally euclidean manifold that means i walk from here as you see the red dots connecting from year to year to year to year and then i complete the journey and i finally come back here so what i am trying to tell is that on a sphere when i look on a global perspective it looks that i am walking on a sphere which is obviously positively curved but when i try to plot the same thing on a kind of a curved manifold or in a curved structure which looks locally uh, which resembles locally euclidean so here you see this is a global structure and this is a local structure so this is a kind of a visual demonstration that why from global structure when we move into local it locally resembles euclidean spoil, uh, space near each point 
now this will give you a visual understanding of what is a manifold visually but the question is that when we are talking that we are uh, walk, uh, uh, walking on curves etc how do we measure that let us come and look into this part of the video so these are the three objects that i have taken i'm not telling what the objects are it will be, uh, become very clear in a few seconds so here is the sphere okay and this lines are going in this direction that means it is converging so obviously it is a positive curvature this is something which is flat that means the lines are parallel it has got a zero curvature and this one as you see they are diverging so uh, so they are they are called a negative curvature so what do i mean by that so all these curvatures and the geodesics technically called geodesics or the lines that we are taken when we plot it around here in this in this kind of a surface so you see the dot 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 what are those that means i am dividing this manifold using the same familiar calculus of dy by dx and what i get is this da that means a differential area when i cut out chunks from the sphere or the positive or the negative curvature and try to plot out and then i infinite simulate divide or differentiate these values then i can apply the rules of calculus so this becomes very simple that is why manifold is called locally euclidean because we can apply our familiar calculus or any other differentiation rules and get the value of the manifold okay so this uh, i think becomes clear and you see these yellow uh, these yellow lines which are yellow boxes i should say uh, looks like a, a euclidean uh, piece of a geometry so these lines actually looks that they are ordinary piece and they are locally euclidean so again i take those yellow boxes and from what i draw is that i can see this is basically a real number or rn where i can plot those lines as x1 x2 dot dot and so on so you see this i can tell technically i should not say that it is similar but i should say that manifold is a space technically a topological space that is locally isomorphic to a cartesian space rn and each of these boxes when zoomed in locally looks isomorphic to a euclidean plane so i should not i should not use the word similar i would technically use the word isomorphic so here you see when i analyze the manifold this looks just as similar as a cartesian plane so it is isomorphic to a cartesian plane so what we can say from here is that manifolds are just ways to extend the surface definitely to two more more the more than three dimensions now when i take this kind of a line a circle or a kind of a helix and a curvy line we say these are one dimensional manifold obviously when i take something like this a sphere or a solid torus or something we call it as a two dimension and manifold so what we see from here is that from this one dimension two dimension manifold you might ask this question that these shapes and spaces are fairly easy and we can use the algebraic equations to describe them so the question is that why do we need a type of a mathematics why do we need a new type of a mathematics because as is it seen from one and two dimensional we can use algebraic equations and we can find out the answer is this it it is not uh, do not necessarily always behaves like higher dimension that means when we move to 3 2 3 or 4 or higher dimensions things won't be that easy things won't behave in that way that we just use algebraic equations to do that so there is no way you could figure it out using only the standard vector calculus or differential uh, differential calculus that is the reason we need this new kind of mathematics so curve in a one dimensional if i take a curve and i i, I just try to plot the line this red line see if it looks like a segment close up now what i do is that when i zoom this line that means i'm further zooming it you see it almost becomes like a straight line and when i take my microscope or magnifying glass and i further zoom it it becomes a straight line so what does i what what do i'm uh, trying to make a point is that this concept that is locally euclidean a curve which looks from uh, outside uh, from a global perspective it is a curve you go further you go further and further you zoom it it becomes like a straight line so here is this line when you zoom it further it becomes like this and when you zoom it further it becomes like this now the question is that all the zooming is fine we got that we need a local euclidean space where we can use low euclidean geometry or maybe our uh, differential calculus in order to calculate the curvatures etc but the aim of differential geometry or maybe even general theory 
relativity is that we need a coordinate free geometry that means what happens when we stretch the surface when we pull that surface i'm not considering of tearing because tearing is something which is not allowed in general in topology of differential geometry i am trying to stretch it that means i'm trying to pull it why i'm trying to pull it because i want to see that after pulling does it inherently maintain that structure that we call that topologically do are all the same inherently is it invariant under bending stretching etc let us look into the next part of our video what is a chart and what is an atlas this comes from the concept of stretching so you see this one this is a plain cartesian coordinate and uh, there are certain lines so i assume that i am taking uh, xy simple cartesian plane and what i am doing is that i am using this function f so that i can do any kind of a calculation i am not mentioning what kind of a calculation it can be any kind of a calculation so we get a function f which somehow determines or measures those lines now you see i am using this green line to show that it is stretched and how does it look it is stretched this one it becomes longer so the coordinate system also stretches right this one uh, this way this goes on the right hand side so when it is stretched you see what uh, what happens is that there may be more than one function f at each point as long as the function doesn't changes the coordinates between them is continuous that means we we get a function which is not this f but maybe more than one two three four functions but that stretching is all okay because what i want is that the coordinates do not change we can uh, measure the vectors and uh, the the change is continuous that means there is no jumps or there were there is no in between jump between the, it should be smooth and continuous don't worry i will explain later what is smooth and continuous because smooth and continuous also Uh, defines something a concept called homeomorphism which i am not covering in this video but what i am trying to tell is that we require that the change of coordinate is continuous because I, it might slice our surface into pieces and that is very difficult to measure now continuous again means continuous derivatives all those concepts i am not covering but continuous means there is no jump in between now you see i get further functions maybe f1 f2 f3 and f4 together all this function is what we technically call it is an atlas so when you hear the concept of atlas in differential geometry it is basically all those functions which are once being stretched from a coordinate to a stretched coordinate it is not one function that is uh, you know doing this domain to domain isomorphing it is taking multiple functions group together this function is called an atlas and each of these functions are called charts so charts are basically individual functions taken together this is known as atlas i will just show you a simple diagram things will become clear right so here you see a coordinate chart is a way of expressing the points of a small neighborhood if you do not understand what would, what is a neighborhood go to my uh, video on topology uh, you will understand i have defined what is a neighborhood this is just the nearing points so an example from geography is the coordinate chart given by the functions of latitude and longitude so what we can say is that in mathematics one describes a manifold using an atlas an atlas consists of individual charts we just saw saw that that uh, the uh, atlas are basically individual charts the total and charts are basically those functions so here i have taken just an arbitrary manifold m and from here what i get is an atlas which is a summation of functions and these are individual functions here they come they go directly to atlas so when i am doing a kind of a stretching the number of functions together are called atlas and these individual functions are known as charts so from charts we go to the differential manifold or the manifold and from manifold in together we come to atlas so i would just like to tell you uh, show you a few more things so here it is phi u which is defined by the local coordinate x a in the set u so these are called pull back that means it is pulling back the uh, basic manifold to rn and what we get is this and this one x a phi u within braces p this is actually the value of the standard coordinates in rn on the right hand side you see a diagram u this is a manifold now you see phi u is uh, is basically charting the level set coordinates from u to phi u and again the inverse is also true so you see phi u within braces to the power minus 1 that means the inverse goes from here to here so the, the basic function is uh, ma mapping from u to phi u and again phi u is mapping back to uh, the level set of coordinates and that is why this one and this one 
So generally we need more than one chart obviously to cover a manifold because an atlas is a collection of charts. We have shown that mathematically it is written as phi u and phi v. So if I do an intersection of two manifolds u and v, we get something which is not equal to zero and this is just a mapping of rn over rn. This function right at the left hand side bottom is called a transition function and this is again a much more clear and a pictorial description. Here I have marked this area uh, in red because the U manifold and the V manifold are intersecting over each other and this is the common place so phi U U and phi V V. So this arrow shows that this is actually the transition. Transition means from one function the movement which happens and which carries the uh, basic essence of the intersection. This one phi U U and phi V V that means the uh, uh, this goes from u to v and again from v to u and this is done also by the inverse. Sometimes it also becomes important for us to know what is not a manifold. We have understood what is a manifold but the, because these are geometrical structures it might happen that you come across a figure and you say okay is it a manifold is it not a manifold. So I will just show you very simple examples so that you understand that what is not a manifold. So you see I have given a technical definition again of a manifold that resembles Euclidean space meaning that every point in manifold there exists a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to an open set. If you don't understand homeomorphic and open set I have already made a video in differential geometry which is called general relativity and differential geometry where I have clearly explained what is a neighborhood and what is a homeomorphic. My request is to go to the playlist and watch it. Anyway, first let us see this one. So this is a cusp, right? So consider a point that looks like a cross or a cusp. Now around this point, no matter how small a neighborhood you take, it will not look in an open set like a locally Euclidean space. So every neighborhood will contain two intersecting lines as you can see I marked in red and this makes it impossible to find a homeomorphism which is an Euclidean space. Hence it is not a manifold. So a cusp which is joining because we cannot find something which is locally Euclidean. This is uh, what we technically call is a singularity. This is not a manifold. Now you see this one. This is called a figure eight, an infinity loop. So the figure eight shape has a self intersection point. You can see very well. Now around this point it is not possible to find a neighborhood that resembles an open set in Euclidean space since the neighborhood will contain a point of intersection. Hence again it is not a manifold. This part of the video is just to give you an understanding that why it is not a manifold and what is that which is not a manifold. You see here a cone with a vertex. A cone with a vertex is not a manifold at the vertex. No matter how small again we make a neighborhood, we consider the vertex, it will always contain the sharp point of the cone which prevents it from resembling a Euclidean space locally. Then comes another example. This is called sphere with a hair. The sphere with a hair is not a manifold. Why? Because it is a point where a line segment is attached to the sphere. Again, the point is not locally homeomorphic to any open set in Euclidean space. So hence it is not a sphere. Lastly, the Cantor set. The Cantor set is not a manifold because it is a fractal and fractals are not smooth. The Cantor set is made up of infinite number of points and it is impossible to zoom in on the Cantor set enough to make it find something which is called locally homeomorphic or local Euclidean space. These examples now clears out the doubt that what is a manifold and what is a manifold but right now this is the right time to know that what are the different types of manifold. I will just show you quickly the types of manifold so that you can understand. We start with the very basic. This is a long line. Then we get a circle. Then we get a real projective line. And then we get a real line which is obviously a single dimensional manifold 0, 1, 2 and then the minus. We go next to this one which is called a cylinder. We got a Klein bottle and then we got a Klein quartic and what we find is a Mobius strip and a sphere. These are manifolds. Here is a simple note. Mobius strip is a manifold but you, when you cut it on the sideways this has become again an example of not a manifold which I have not shown in this video. Coming back next more complex structures like this. This is a three sphere very difficult. This is a solid torus. This is a white field whitehead manifold which was discovered by J.H.C. Whitehead who was the founder of the homotopy theory. Then we come to E8 manifold, uh, then we come to Enrica surface and we find Del Pesa surface, then we find complex projective plane and exotic R4 which was discovered by Michael Friedman, American 
differential geometer uh, in around 1982. These are the different types of manifold. We are going well, we are understanding manifold, etc. But have you ever thought that who actually coined the term manifold? Who was the discoverer? Who actually coined the term manifold and we came to know? There is a very interesting and an intriguing history coming up into the next part of our video. I hope I don't need to mention this person's name. Bernhard Riemann uh, was born in what is known as the Federal Republic of Germany in 1826. Riemann was the second of six children of a Lutheran pastor who taught his son until he turned 10. The young Riemann was shy and nervous but was gifted in mathematics so much that while attending high school in Hanover, his knowledge sometimes surpassed that his teachers. In 1846, his father scrapped all his entire fund to send his son to the University of Göttingen, where Riemann initially intended to study theology so that he could support his family. But when he attended lectures by Carl Friedrich Gauss and Moritz Stern, this is the University of Göttingen, who inspired him to switch his studies. With his uh, parents' blessings, Riemann transferred to the University of Berlin the following year, studying some of the most prominent mathematicians of all time. Now Gauss described Riemann as having a gloriously fertile originality. In his report on the thesis and two years later when Riemann was required to give a lecture to land a position in Göttingen, Gauss assigned him his star pupil to the topic which is called this one, the foundations of geometry which was seemingly a mundane and a boring topic in the hands of a lesser mathematician. But Riemann did not disappoint his mentor. Despite a phobia of public speaking, he used this opportunity to develop a highly original theory of higher dimensions. In his lecture on the hypothesis which lie at the foundations of geometry, which was delivered on June 10, 1854, that included a workable definition of how one might measure the curvature of a space. It was not published until two years after his death in 1866 and is now considered one of the most important works in geometry. The lecture consisted of two parts. First, the question of how we might define an n-dimensional space resulted in the definition of Riemann's place, including the Riemann Riemann tensor and this laid the foundation of the uh, what is called Riemannian geometry and the second part of the lecture Riemann discussed the dimensions of real space of what geometry one should use to describe it. This is considered to be one of the greatest work in the history of differential geometry through which he came to know and understood what geometry and Riemannian geometry is all about. So you see this actually came from the term manifold or manifoldness and uh, he distinguished between, I, I won't uh, spell out these terms, these are difficult German terms. So this means continuous manifold, discontinuous manifold, etc. And depends on whether, and you could see it was done in the Gottingen opening lecture in 1854. So you understand, Gauss gave him such a boring, difficult topic, but the genius of Riemann brought it in such a uh, beautiful and glorious manner that this book became one of the greatest book ever found in geometry. So you see this book, this is by Bernhard Riemann and who translated it? Another great mathematician, William Kingdon Clifford, who is known for his Clifford algebra. So you see, I've just summarized and I've under, underlined those German words with the help of few of my friends. Continuous or discrete manifold, discrete manifoldness. These are English terms, but uh, taken from this German original. So this words actually shows manifold. So Riemann sketched the draft for a conceptual starting point was to become a general set theory, discrete manifolds and topology of continuous manifolds. Further going, you see that a change of coordinates would lead to locally invertible differentiable real functions. This is invertible, uh, important. That means this is invertible and this is real functions. And this paper gave birth to the concept of manifold and Riemann's intuitive no notion evolved into what is today formalized as manifold. Riemannian manifolds and Riemann surfaces are named after Bernhard Riemann. So that's it for today's video, a brief uh, intuitive and mathematical understanding of manifold. So what we learned today, what is the necessity of a manifold, what are the distinctive features of manifold, what are the other subjects that deals with manifold, what is a manifold, a visual demonstration, what are charts and atlases, what is not a manifold, different types of manifold and the genius of Bernhard Riemann who gave birth to the term manifold. 
So thank you very much for watching this video. I would be very happy if you please subscribe to my channel Physics for Students. Click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. This is my email ID where you can contact me and you can further follow me on my Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter account. Physics for Students will be soon back with few more uh, videos because Manifold has just started and it's a huge ocean and we need to cover a lot of topics into that. Till then, goodbye.